Hi everyone, we're gonna get started. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Rush and I teach in the nonfiction writing program here at Brown. I'm here to welcome you to the annual Casey Shearer Lecture. This lectureship, sponsored by Brown University and the Goldway Shearer family, was established in the memory of Casey Shearer, class of 2000. A promising young writer and aspiring sportscaster, he died in May of that year before he was able to graduate. The Goldway Shearer family also sponsors the annual Casey Shearer Memorial Award for Excellence in Creative Nonfiction. Winners of this year's essay competition will be announced in the spring, so stay tuned, and also send us your submissions. We're so grateful to their family and for their support. Thank you also to the Initiative for Environmental Humanities, the Shane Family Fund, and the English Department. Thank you to Michael Stewart, without, with whom I've been organizing the series for years, and to Tiara Sherlock, our brilliant Utra. Woo, Tiara! <laughs> uh, thank you to Aaron Fine and Ellen Viola and Rick Rambis and Emily Hipchin, without whom none of this would have been possible. Two tiny pieces of housekeeping. Please do buy a copy of one of Ross's brilliant books from 20 Stories, our amazing, uh, fabulous indie here in Providence. They will be for sale, um, and, and he'll be signing them after tonight's event. And also, please remember, no selfies. Our esteemed guest this evening is Ross Gay. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Michael and I have been dreaming of bringing Ross Gay here for years. Every time I read a Ross Gay book or poem or essay, I feel as though I'm gulping it down. It's like the way my three-year-old son drinks warm milk in the morning. He lifts the cup to his mouth and starts swallowing, and the whole world around him gets still and sweet. The air fills with his rhythmic respiration as he pulls oxygen into his lungs, through his nose, steady and slow so he can drink up all of his milk in a single gulp. Sure, he's thirsty, but there's also something else going on. When Nico's done, he pulls the cup away to reveal a crazy grin and a great milk mustache. Reading Roske is kind of like that for me. I'm not gulping it down because the plot is tight or there's a series of cliffhangers making me wonder who done it nor am I gulping it down out of sheer formal wonderment, though there is certainly some of that. The gulping comes from that beautiful marriage of deep pleasure and deep need. The cup of warm milk at 6.45 in the morning after a whole night of having drunk nothing. I'm not the only one who feels this way. Last year, I gave this book to a lot of people for Christmas, including a dear friend. And at the party she and her husband graciously hosted, a dinner so delicious we took not a single photo of the evening, she told me how she felt that she really believed that Ross Gay, she really believed Ross Gay when he said his mom wanted to cook a big feast for her. What generosity, she explained. This is a friend whose relationship with her own parents had grown a little rocky a friend who'd lost a lot in the previous years. It made me doubly glad for the gift of Ross Gay and for the writing, for what his writing had given to her. That sensation of being held, of being cared for during an otherwise dark time. Last week in class, someone said they quickly realized that they could not, would not read Inciting Joy and the little snippets of time they had between other activities, which is how they claimed to be doing all their other readings for the class. <laughs> they said that they quickly realized that once they picked up a piece of Ross Gay's writing, they knew, just knew, that they would not be able to walk away from it before it was done. There it was again, that whole two sides of the one same coin thing. This time, care and demand. Roske's writing pays both deep attention to its readers while also asking something of us. 
Might you be able to show up for the folks that you are in relationship with, offering them a little something extra? A nod of the head, a liberated fig, a compliment on their killer risotto? Let me show you how, he seems to be saying, because every little bit helps. I mean, isn't that one of the singular greatest things literature can achieve? I know of no one else's words who make quite as much goodness happen as those written by Ross Gay. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you so much. I was going to sit on a stool, but I decided I'm going to stand. <clears throat> it's good to be here. Um, you know, the, I think the first time I was in this town, I was playing football um, against Brown. I went to a college that played you all. <clears throat> but anyway, and I was thinking today that one of the times that I was here, I was with some friends visiting one of my friend's folks. And that during that visit, I figured out the shape of my second book. Like it, one of my friends asked me a question that pulled, her name's Elaine Sexton, it pulled the um, book into, into a kind of shape. And anyway, so that feels um, really special about this place too. <clears throat> um, so good to get to know you, Elizabeth. And Kevin Kwashi, like, you know, one of the most important writers to me. Um, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, and you all. And you all. I'm going to read a poem, then I'm going to read an essay, and then I'm going to read a poem. This is called To the Fig Tree on Ninth and Christian. <clears throat> you know, just so you know, like, You'll get it from the poem, but this is like a real fig tree. <laughs> and this really happened. I was walking down the street, and all these figs were on the ground. And we were gathered around. To the fig tree on Ninth and Christian. Tumbling through the city in my mind without once looking up the racket in the lug work, probably rehearsing some stupid thing I said or did, some crime or other. The city, they say, is a lonely place until, yes, the sound of sweeping, and a woman, yes, with a broom beneath which you are now to the canopy of a fig its arms pulling the September sun to it. And she has a hose, too, and so rinse hard, it works hard rinsing and scrubbing the sidewalk, lest some poor sod slip on the silk of a fig and break his hip and not probably reach over to gobble up the perpetrator. The light catches the veins in her hands when I ask about the tree. They flutter in the air, and she says, take as much as you can, please help me. So I load my pockets and mouth, and she points to the stepladder against the wall to mean, take more, please. But I was without a sack, so my meager plunder would have to suffice. And an old woman whom gravity was pulling into the earth loosed one from a low-slung branch, and its eye wept like hers, which she dabbed with a kerchief as she cleaved the fig with what remained of her teeth. And soon there were eight or nine people gathered beneath the tree, looking into it like a constellation, pointing, do you see it? And I am tall. <laughs> and so good for these things. And a bald man even told me so when I grabbed three or four for him reaching into the giddy throngs of yellow jackets, sugar stone, which he only pointed to smiling and rubbing his stomach. I mean, he was really rubbing his stomach. <laughs> like there was a baby in there. It was hot. His head shone while he offered recipes to the group using words which I couldn't understand. And besides, I was a little tipsy on the dance of the velvety heart rolling in my mouth, pulling me down and down into the oldest countries of my body, where I ate my first fig from the hand of a man who escaped his country by swimming through the night, and maybe never said more than five words to me at once, but he gave me figs. 
And a man on his way to work hops twice to reach at last his fig, which he smiles at and calls baby. Come here, baby, he says, and blows a kiss to the tree, which everyone knows cannot grow this far north, being Mediterranean and favoring the rocky, sun-baked soils of Jordan and Sicily. But no one told the fig tree or the immigrants. There is a way the fig tree grows in groves. It wants, it seems, to hold us. Yes, I am anthropomorphizing, goddammit. I have twice in the last 30 seconds rubbed my sweaty forearm into someone else's sweaty shoulder, gleeful, eating out of each other's hands on Christian Street in Philadelphia, a city like most which has murdered its own people. This is true. We are feeding each other from a tree at the corner of Christian and Ninth, strangers maybe never again. And then I'm going to read this essay from a, this is from a book called Inciting Joy. And we talked about it in the class today. That conversation was so fun for me and useful. So thank you for that. And um, this is like 14 essays. For those of you who don't know this book, it's 14 essays. And I was just sort of wondering about these sort of different, you know, I don't know what the word is, but like sort of practices, um, maybe, um, that, that sort of cinch up the tethers between us. That's sort, of, that's sort of my question. How is it that some of the stuff that we do might incite what I think of as joy? Oh, my heart, gratitude, the 14th incitement. And there's an epigraph, and it says, I am a brick in a house that is being built around your house. And that's from Cornelius, Cornelius Eadie's poem, Gratitude. Given that I have already blathered on enough about gratitude elsewhere, get ready for the longest parenthetical ever. <laughs> Truth be told, in my book, by which I mean in my opinion, there is no blathering on enough about gratitude. The real thing, I mean. There is no enough to gratitude. And it does not in the least seem an ill-conceived exercise, devotion, project, life, to do nothing other than list or ha catalog said gratitudes, perhaps starting with the interior of what before your devotional, your practice, you considered your body. But now, because you are thanking the trillion or so microbes in your gut and creepy crawling your skin and slathering lasciviously through your mouth and eyeballs and nostrils, critters, some of whom, if they get ill and die off, you will be a goner in a heartbeat, invisible EMTs. You might start there. That is a trillion gratitudes. That ought to keep you busy. Or my God, who shouts out skin anymore? I don't mean the luster or hue, all of which are gobsmackingly stunning, and that those hues change most often in relation to the sun, that our sun is one of the many evidences that we are directly related to the sunflower and other heliotropic critters, gobsmack. I mean the simple fact of our skin, an envelope or satchel or sack to hold our guts in and how it changes and becomes an archive or a repository of those changes. Mine variously stretch marked, popped, dimpled, flappy, hairy, scarred, grooved, smooth, sagging, of different hues, and as yet dear unacknowledged accomplice holding my guts in. The eyelash, good lord, high five to that, <laughs> saliva, Nose hairs, unbecoming though we often say you are, you do your job, whatever it is, thank you. <laughs> Ear hairs too, more prominent by the day, I notice. And this knee like a, pepper gr like a pepper grinder, but still bending, still not chalk. We can carry on with the body like this inside, which even if it is broken beyond repair, probably, though not necessarily, 
there is a rectum and an anus to let the shit out, which either way constitutes a gratitude. There is tubing in there we do not know and maybe do not want to, but that might like to know we are grateful. Thank you, stank tubing in there. This is just the body we're talking about, and we haven't even begun. I mean, mammals have hair, which, though the source of much consternation and prohibition and hand-wringing, is actually an astonishment, and I have been the lucky recipient of so much simple creaturely tending because of it. Dozing off in between the legs of some dear braider tugging the strands tight. Teeth. The gums that hold them in your mouth. You have to be kidding me. Fingernails. If you got a nose, and even if that nose is perpetually stuffed or busted by a rogue elbow, it might one day, who knows, drag you to a lily that smells precisely like your mother, who is getting old. And if you got toes, whether crooked or not, we can go out from the body gradually like this to the furthest reaches of our imaginations, gratituding the world, garlanding the world with gratitude, an hour a day, a day a week, a week a year. We could do it always and forever and never arrive at the last gratitude. We could never do it enough. Let's try. Let's start today, shall we? End parentheses. <laughs> I want to keep this one quick. <laughs> Periodically, I will catch wind of a response to my work, though I do everything I can to avoid being downwind of such things. Social media, they call it. Though from what I hear, it seems sometimes antisocial and carcinogenic. That is something along the lines of, as the writer Hanif Abdurraqib has written beautifully about, a white woman at a reading of mine same, saying something like, quote, how can a black man write about flowers at a time like this? To which I know I should just wave my hand in front of my face like there's a gnat buzzing around or pretend the gnat isn't there. But my first response is actually something along the lines of, you need to grow up if you think it's not always a time like this. And you need to shut up if you think you know what this black man or anyone ought to be writing right now. Grow up and shut up. You know, my editor made the choice, and I don't think it's a great choice. I'm going to read it how it was before my editor made the choice. <laughs> you need to grow the fuck up if you think it's not always a time like this. And you need to shut the fuck up if you think you know what this black man or anyone ought to be writing right now. Grow the fuck up and shut the fuck up. <laughs> but I try to know better than to spend time on that question, which is no question at all. It's a shackle. It's a cell. But this other one I do want to spend a little more time with. Someone mentioned to me some post or tweet or whatever that was something along the lines of, quote, any grown black poet talking about gratitude, dot, dot, dot. I forget the rest, but it was approximately, must have his pea brain head up his own nasty ass. Somehow I gathered this commentator was black, and they were talking about me. My first response was kind of self-protective or defensive. It hurt my feelings, I'm saying, though I know I shouldn't say so. I was like, hand on chest, ouch, my heart. And my second response, sympathetic to the heartbreak and rage from which the tweet was launched, footnote, are tweets launched? <laughs> I understand, too, or at least I get the impression, I have heard, that tweets are often discharged like machine gun fire that there is not always the same kind of revised, refined, contemplative, considered comportment of something like, well, what you are currently reading. I get that. From which the tweet was launched was the same. Ouch. My heart. Anyway, it is to ouch my heart that this brief meditation, and probably to this whole book, is addressed. It is true that we are often implored, 
or compelled, especially by institutions that have the power to kill us, by which I mean the power to withhold the resource for resources for life and the power to exterminate us, to be grateful. The very most obvious is something along the lines of, you should just be grateful you have a job here. Or you should just be grateful we let you in. Or you should just be grateful you have any health insurance. Or you should just be grateful you have a roof over your head at all. Or you should just be grateful the incinerator is not next door. Or you should just be grateful it only definitively causes three types of cancer. Or you should just be grateful we didn't log all the trees. Or you should just be grateful it seems to move out of the soil in a generation or two. Or you should just be grateful we put up a sound barrier on the highway we ran through your neighborhood. Or you should just be grateful they aren't all extinct. Or you should just be grateful we didn't take everything. Or you should just be grateful they make inhalers for that. Or you should just be grateful there's a shot. Or you should just be grateful we're not suing you. Or you should just be grateful it wasn't worse. Or you should just be grateful we let you sleep under the bridge. Or you should just be grateful we have a treatment for those comorbidities we gave you. Or you should just be grateful that after we occupied your territory, we let you stay living there on the outskirts. Or you should just be grateful that after we took your neighborhood, we still let you shop at the Whole Foods by Amazon. Or you should just be grateful we haven't yet patent patented that seed. Or you should just be grateful that we're delivering bottled water. Or you should just be grateful for the test kit. Or you should just be grateful for the gas mask. Or you should just be grateful for the boats we've left on shore. You'll find in each one a small compartment with Band-Aids, bootstraps, antibiotics, water purifier, sunscreen, GPS, slicker, one spare telescoping oar, a coupon book, Ray-Bans, a fishing pole and camp stove, a boat repair kit, Bill Gates' autobiography, <laughs> the transcripts of all 800,000 TED Talks, a subscription to Forbes, a Tesla rechargeable reading light biometric monitor to keep you safe, we'll keep an eye on you, a Nike visor to the brim of which you can attach the aforementioned, and vitamin C tablets, the stores of which we will replenish monthly by helicopter. Just use the QR code. We won't charge you much. We'll keep a tab for which, in case you forgot, you should just shut your mouth and be grateful. And though today, riding my bike down a narrow one-way road and seeing the oncoming very big American truck, maroon, and no shoulder or place for me to go, I thought, God, I hope this dude doesn't plow into me by murder or madness or accident, having been for a time, time to time, kind of wanting to drive my car into things, usually other cars or trees or telephone poles or walls head on, not to hurt anyone or anything, but to quiet my hurting mind. And I breathed an actual sigh of relief as the big extended mirror passed me by, the whoosh of which by my face flushed from my mouth the word blessed. The way my friend Don used to always say it, bringing forth with his big, sad smile the church ladies as he did so, blessed, or have a blessed day, like my Nana says, all right, baby, be blessed now. It strikes me as an ancestral ethos. Hang on now. I was going to say that I felt blessed that dude didn't plow me, dude as human force that could kill me, dude as state or multinational corporation that would gladly plow through me for shareholder satisfaction. But also that I don't know if I'd call that blessedness gratitude, especially considering my own previous potentially collaterally homicidal ideation. But I think I probably would call it 
grace, every moment of escape, how many actual millions of them do we carry in the suitcases of our bodies? No, let's say the trees of our bodies, because grace shares a root, you see it there, don't you, with gratitude. Amazing. Yes, my favorite concert movie of all time is neither Dave Chappelle's Block Party nor Richard Pryor Live on the Sunset Strip. It is Amazing Grace, the documentary of the making of Aretha Franklin's record of the same, no same name. The movie and record, made incidentally within months of Nina Simone's live album, Emergency Ward, features selections from Franklin's live performances January 13th to 14th, 1972, at the New Temple Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, supported by the Southern California Community Choir under the direction of Alexander Hamilton. I want to point you to the moment in the film at the conclusion of the first night's performance, about two thirds of the way through their rendition of Amazing Grace, during which the Reverend James Cleveland, convener, vocalist, and pianist, is spotted away from the choir and his piano with his head in his hands, crying, falling apart. And the choir, just like the audience, is moved every which way. And after Aretha has a quick rest, sits and wipes her face some, and the Reverend recovers and puts his jacket back on and returns to his post, guiding the choir in their sturdy, buffeted, shouted harmonies, which, too, draw Aretha to her feet and back to the podium. Safe, safe, safe. So safe, she responds. So safe with Jesus. Aretha sings, and it's grace. You might know the song. You might sing along that will lead me home. And in a miracle of footage, as though to anticipate our reflex to designate Franklin a singular talent, a distinguished genius, a solitary voice, as though to anticipate our desire to never mind the choir and never mind the organist in the band and never mind the Reverend James Cleveland and never mind the parishioners and never mind the goddamn lyrics to the song, and never mind all her teachers and guides and elders, never mind who came before her, swept the stage, or fixed the lights, or tuned the piano, or made the key, or cooked or grew the food that fed her mother's 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 mother. Never mind her mother's 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 mother's. Never mind all by which she is even standing before us in this first place. Grace, through her sung as it had never been before, amazing. We behold that the Reverend James Cleveland, who has come to stand next to her at the podium, has his hand wrapped in the back of her dress as though he is holding her up. I mean, he is holding her up. And Aretha Franklin is holding his hand, holding her up as though she is holding him up. I mean, she is holding him up. They are holding each other up. The grace of footage lets us behold how they be holding each other up. How we be holding each other up. And as she unfurls another melismatic amazing, his mouth moves with hers. And though they aren't indistinguishable from one another, neither are they separate. And that miracle of footage, that glimpse of microcosmic holding points to the macrocosmic holding of which, if it isn't yet plain, I beg you to listen again, watch again, Ms. Aretha Franklin's voice is simply the beautiful evidence. Or another way to put it, Aretha Franklin's voice, quiet as it's kept, my favorite song on that album, the one that is on repeat in my head as I compose this, the one of the songs I hope might accompany as I walk out of this still pretty bouncy sack of bones, is Holy Holy. 
the cover of the Marvin Gaye song. Or another way to put it, Aretha Franklin's voice is not only singing about, but is evidence of grace, which is defined as, quote, God's unmerited favor, love, or help. What I call a macrocosmic holding, but what also might be called gift. Although I know the dangers of reading the comments, not so much on these YouTube clips, and one of the more frequent and astute observations there is that Aretha Franklin was touched or carrying forth or channeling or the conveyor to us of a gift that, though it came through her, was not exactly hers. None of which, for the record, diminishes the labor, the practice, the time she spent, let's not say spent, let's say devoted, let's say gave, cultivating that gift. Or a better way to say it maybe is being grateful for that gift. Though there is certainly a discourse of diminishment, particularly among the gifting of black people, that would make it seem so. You know, white people work hard and black people are gifted. But ouch, my heart, I only barely want to acknowledge that because we're not talking about them. The them is the same them telling us what to write, what to think about, what to love. Them is the same them telling us we ought to be grateful they let us live. We're talking about Aretha Franklin, whose gifts or gratitude remind us of giftedness, remind us of gift. And gifts, as Robin Wall Kimmerer writes in Braiding Sweetgrass, quote, from the earth or from each other establish a particular relationship, an obligation of sorts to give, to receive, and to reciprocate, end quote. Kimmerer recounts how as a child she would run through the fields when the wild strawberries would come on, getting on her stomach or back to receive the gift of the fruit, which came only for a short time and which gave of themselves so that she might have some sweetness, or, she says, still learning patience and sometimes gobbling up the still white berries, sourness. She was learning from the strawberries that the earth and all bounty that comes from the earth, which is to say, isn't it, ouch, my heart, everything, is a gift, which is a radically different notion than the one we are just barely surviving. I'm talking about capitalism and settler colonialism and all the entangled brutalities and lies we are told are the truth and that we ought to be grateful for it. Kimmerer writes, quote, the fundamental nature of gifts is that they move and their value increases with their passage. The fields made a gift of strawberries to us and we made a gift of them to our Father. The more something is shared, the greater its value becomes. This is hard to grasp for society steeped in notions of private property, where others, we, are by definition excluded from sharing." End quote. And a few paragraphs later, quote, the essence of the gift is that it creates a set of relationships. The currency of a gift economy is, at its root, reciprocity, end quote. But the currency of the brutal economy is the opposite of reciprocity, theft, hoarding, dispossession, alienation. The brutal economy is a system of lies, a net of stories, a noose of agreements that turns whoever owns the most or signs the checks or holds the keys or wields the gavel or stamps the papers or has a spaceship unless you're Sun Ra, <laughs> into a god to whom, at least that's what they think, because it's true, they're killing us, we should be grateful. In the theft economy, the gods might not give you a visa, they might put you in the street, they will for sure bust up your union. They can take you in if they want, they're putting sludge in the river, they're putting a pipeline through as we speak, they're doing everything they can to keep burning up the world. Given this, ouch, my heart, I understand the impulse 
directed a tad meanly at me, gotta say, but nah, we're cool. To be like, fuck gratitude. Or to be like any grown poet talking about gratitude, etc. I get it. I mean, I really get it. Let's take one horrible, though superb, example. Have you read Chris Manjapra's March 29th, 2018 article in The Guardian? In it, he tells how reparations were paid to England's white former enslavers and their descendants until about 2015, which is so absurd that it's almost impossible to hear. So I will say it again, a touch differently. When England unenslaved their enslaved population, it collected a tax from its citizens to pay white reparations to the former enslavers and their descendants. A tax which would have been paid, yep, also by formerly enslaved people and their descendants. Which means, just want to be clear here, that the ancestors of the enslaved were paying the ancestors of the enslavers for letting their people go until 2015. Emancipation. <laughs> Jubilee. As nuts as it sounds, I know you know it's a dime a dozen. We will take your land. We will take your people. We will take your language. We will take your livelihood. We will take your everything. But yay, for those who slip through, here's your life. What's left of it? You won't recognize it, but you'll have to pay us for it anyway. And how about you show a little goddamn gratitude? It's called being grateful at the barrel of a gun which you can't be. I mean, there is a monk out there who can be, <laughs> but I ain't that monk. Nor should you be. Oh, my heart. That's not gratitude. That's being extorted. Footnote. T-shirt, keychain, etc. idea. Maybe not for the goop set. Extorted. I was lucky enough to meet a couple of the winners of the 2013 Food Sovereignty Prize at Black Oak Center, a community resilience project outside of Kankakee, Illinois. One of the winners was from the Dessaline Brigade in Haiti, a peasant farmer, as she called herself. And as one of the recipients of the prize, she was touring farming projects around the United States. I got there a few minutes late and joined the just departing tour of the property the fields and beehives and herbal apothecary. There were about 15 of us, and eventually we arrived after walking through a greenhouse at a star-shaped plot planted in strawberries, herbs, and more. Our host, Dr. Jafunza Wright Carter, who, in addition to being one of the co-founders of Black Oaks along with her husband, Fred Carter, was Gwendolyn Brooks's primary care physician. Blessed. Grace. She told us we were at the Ancestral Garden, where all the visitors came when they arrived. It is here, Dr. J said, that we lay down the sorrows of slavery and colonialism and imperialism. It is here, she said, that together we lay our sorrows down, which we did, holding the hands of who was next to us. She didn't tell us this is one of the definitions of joy holding each other through the sorrow because she didn't have to. The strawberries and the lemon balm did that. We retreated into the kitchen where we ate from an excellent potluck. Places such as these, Black Oaks, Soul Fire Farm, the Bloomington Community Orchard, etc., as a rule, do the most badass potlucks. I remember soup and homemade bread and beans and, as always, noting that the squash, potatoes, and kale came from the field, the thyme and rosemary, you saw them on your way in, right over there. Tony brought the green beans, and Gilbert brought the kombucha. It's called grace. It means gratitude. It's just how we do. It was chilly. We were huddled a little closer than if it wasn't. And for those of us not from the upper Midwest, it was freezing, as our Brazilian and Haitian friends noted a few times. 
But we just huddled and laughed and kept our mugs full of tea. Lemon balm from the ancestral garden. Tiana brought the mint. We asked questions and told stories and took notes sometimes and sometimes not. The light changed in the room, the shadows on our faces. We spoke a few different languages, Creole, Portuguese, English, Spanish, French. So we were in one of those beautiful circuits of translation, relying on each other to understand each other, as always, again. Oh, my heart. It was during this conversation that I heard this powerful story about the Dessalines Brigade. Shortly after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, itself a victim of upside down reparations, itself a victim of centuries of fathomless plunder, Monsanto, seeing in this disaster a new market for their products, which includes, among others, hybrid seeds, genetically modified seeds, and glyphosate, or Roundup, an herbicide so ubiquitous, sprayed on so many millions of acres, that in addition to being on, in much, being on or in much of our food, it is in our water, it is probably in our bodies, delivered a gift of tons and tons of their hybrid seed to Haiti. It surely to some looked like a gesture of benevolence, largesse, the same way so much so-called aid does. Except that hybrid seed is not really viable for saving because it sometimes doesn't make seed. It sometimes makes sterile seed. And if it does make viable seed, that seed will likely not come true or be like its parent. Therefore, the farmers who used that seed would likely end up ensnared having to buy their seed in the future from Monsanto, as opposed to saving it as they had done, as we have done, as has been done for us for millennia. That's to say, accepting this gift from Monsanto would also mean forsaking the gift of wisdom and care and love that is carried in the vault of their own seed, their own practices. Of course, those practices are precisely what Monsanto is hoping to replace, erase, with practices of its own. And by erasing, we're talking about seed and practice enslaving. Actually, I mean re-enslaving which the Dessaline Brigade saw coming from miles away, like the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And so, in what to many seemed an act of wild ingratitude, from inside the rubble and the need, it was a party, a celebration. They burnt Monsanto's seed. I think I do not need to tell you, oh, my heart, that refusal that fire, that party, is what I mean by gratitude. Gratitude to who brought the seed, often under great duress, for us. Gratitude to the land, the earth, for giving and receiving the seed, often under great duress, for us. Gratitude to the water and the sun and the soil. What is the soil other than the trillion gratitudes? who would germinate the seed for us. Gratitude to the pollinators who would bring forth the fruit, or the wind who would shiver the tassel for us. Gratitude to the trees who housed the creatures, made the shade, held the soil together, died and joined their bodies to the trillion gratitudes from which the seeds would grow again and again for us. Their refusal of the fake gift is a radical joining. And that joining, oh my heart, is gratitude. Shortly before the food sovereignty folks had to be on their way to their next stop, as we were finishing our tea and desert dessert, I, I will never forget it as long as I live, a young black farmer asked the Haitian farmer from the Dessalines Brigade, who, remember, they burnt the seeds, what they do when it's difficult, when times were hard and it was a challenge to keep going. She half smiled and looked into the corner, shivering there in her borrowed ski cap beneath her hoodie pulled up. And then she laughed, looked the young farmer in the eye, and she said, oh, 
my heart, we sing. That song, too, oh, my heart, through the difficulty which is sometimes profound, inconceivable, as far as I'm concerned, is gratitude. It was taught to us, given to us grace, amazing, by our ancestors, some of whom survived the unsurvivable, endured the unendurable, and some of whom did not. That song was given to us by our ancestors, those who lived and those who died, who they said were property and whose life was a refusal, a disowning, an insurgent gratitude. Our fleeting bodies, oh my heart, the flowers of that insurgence. And we replant that insurgent gratitude by saving the seeds we have been given and giving them away. I think that's what the writer Toy Derricott means in her poem, The Telecycle, when she says that, quote, joy is an act of resistance, end quote. The luminous mycelial tethers between us, our fundamental connection to one another, the raft through the sorrow, the holding through the grief joy is, reminds us again and again that we belong not to an institution or a party or a state or a market, but to each other, needfully so, which we must practice and study and sing and story and dream and celebrate, belonging to each other as though our lives depended on it. And when we sing like that, oh, my heart, what then? Oh, my heart, it's a real question. My heart, what then? Thank you. And I'm just going to finish with this um, last poem, which I'm going to preface with this quote from the writer Arundhati Roy from her book, Capitalism, A Ghost Story, where she asks this question, do we need weapons to fight wars? Or do we need wars to create a market for weapons? After all, the economies of Europe the United States and Israel depend hugely on their weapons industry. It's the one thing they haven't outsourced to China. I think we all know there's a genocide happening in Palestine right now. Um, that's passive voice. It's Israel and the United States. My uh, university, I keep saying that, but I don't mean that. The place where I am employed has just made a big $111, $111 million commitment to defense and, um, what do they call it? Defense and surveillance. And they say actually with something to say like internal and external applications. This is called Prayer for My Unborn Niece or Nephew. After the poet Adeselius Girmay. Today, November 28th, 2005 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I'm staring at my hands in the common pose of the hungry and penitent. I'm studying again the emptiness of my clasped hands, wherein I see my sister-in-law days from birthing the small thing that will erase, in some sense, the mystery of my father's departure. Their child will emerge with 10 fingers and toes howling, and his mother will hold his gummy mouth to her breast, and the stars will hang above them, and not one bomb will be heard through that night. 
And my brother will stir, waking with his wife the first few days, and he will run his long fingers along the soft terrain of his child's skull, and not once will he cover the child's ears or throw the two to the ground and cover them from the blast. And this child will gaze into a night that is black and quiet. She will pull herself up to her feet, standing like a buoy in wind-grooved waters, falling and rising again, never shaken by an explosion. And her grandmother will watch her stumble through a park or playground, will watch her sail through the air on swings, howling with joy, and never once will she snatch her from the swing and run for shelter because again the bombs are falling. The two will drink cocoa, the beautiful lines in my mother's face growing deeper as she smiles at the beautiful boy flipping the pages of a book with pictures of dinosaurs, and no bomb will blast glass into this child's face, leaving the one eye useless. No bomb will loosen the roof, crushing my mother while this child sees plaster and wood and blood where once his nana sat. This child will not sit with his nana, killed by a bomb for hours. I will never drive across two states to help my brother bury my mother this way, to pray and weep and beg this child to speak again. She will go to school with other children, and some of them will have more food than others, and some will be the witnesses of great crimes, and some will describe flavors with colors, and some will have seizures, and some will read two grade levels ahead, but none of them will tip their desks and shield their faces, nor watch as their teacher falls out of her shoes, clinging to the nearest child, for again, the bombs are dropping. This child will bleed and cry and curse his living parents and slam doors and be hurt and hurt again. And she will feel clover on her bare feet will swim in frigid waters, will climb trees and spy cardinal chicks blind and peeping, and no bomb will kill this child's parents. No bomb will kill this child's grandparents. No bomb will kill this child's uncles. And no bomb will kill this child who will raise to his mouth some small morsel of food of which there is more while bombs fall from the sky like dust brushed from the hands of a stupid god and children whose parents named them will become dust and their parents will drape themselves in black and dream of the tiny mouths which once reared to suckle or gasp at some bird sailing by and their tears will make a mud which will heal nothing. And today I will speak no word except the name of that child whose absence makes the hands of her parents shiver. A name that had a meaning, as will yours. Thank you.